mentally ill Yemeni man say he's been subjected to a form of medieval water torture. And a Guantanamo Bay inmate sues the US military and President Obama, launching a legal battle to end torture widely practiced at the infamous detention center. Welcome to RT International, coming to you live from Moscow. It is now 5 p.m. here in the Russian capital. Over 500 people have been sentenced to death in Egypt. They're all supporters of the former president, Mohamed Morsi, ousted last year in a military coup. Bel True is in Cairo with the details. This is one of the largest death penalty verdicts, I think, in Egyptian history. This case refers to a day of violence following the forced... Uh, clearings of two Cairo citizens in the capital. We saw a lot of retaliatory violence from supporters of Mohamed Morsi with people attacking churches and police stations. In this instance, the court ruled uh, that these people did kill a police officer and attempted to kill two others. Um, and there are 16 people who are also acquitted in this case. But it's a significant escalation on the behalf um, of the authorities against the supporters of Mohamed Morsi. They say that the Brotherhood is a terrorist organization, that the leadership have incited violence, and that the protesters have used force against security forces. The verdict that is this large, we do expect to see a significant reaction from the Muslim Brotherhood and their supporters, who have been coming out to the streets almost on a daily basis since Mohamed Morsi was ousted in last July. They all call these verdicts politicized and maintain their protesters are peaceful um, and that they are just pushing for their democratic rights to have Mark Morsi reinstated. However, we may have also at the same time uh, rival protest groups supporting the military coming down to the streets. There are a lot of people here in Egypt who do regard the Muslim Brotherhood as a violent organization and the protesters as having attacked security forces and they will defend the government. So we will see, I think, quite a lot of action on the streets in the coming days as these rival protest groups take to the streets to defend their positions. And this is all happening, of course, in the lead up to the presidential elections, which is due to take place in just a few weeks. So it'll be very tense times here in Egypt. Now, Professor Saeed Sadek in Cairo says that, scarred by the Arab Spring, the military government is flexing its muscles to hold off further unrest. 99 police stations were attacked and the police officers were killed. Now the state wants to be as if it's authority. Otherwise, we will become chaotic like Libya, like Syria. And that's why it was very important that the government and the, and the judicial system sends a strong message that we must protect the, the, the state and the institutions. What can the government do? If the government decides to be weak, and I was watching the social media and many welcome the sentence and said, finally, the state is becoming firm with the terrorists. Finally, the state is taking action against criminals. Now, two major events have kicked off in The Hague. The G7 gathering is focusing on the Ukrainian crisis, while a key security summit is aiming to reduce the world's nuclear weapon supplies. Ukraine's interim prime minister was expected at both events, but decided against going in order to meet bankers from the International Monetary Fund. That's as more and more politicians in Kiev are openly calling for Ukraine to go nuclear. RT's Igor Piskunov explains. This is a massive uh, summit. We're talking about uh, senior politicians and chief diplomats from over 50 countries, which have all gathered here in The Hague in the Netherlands to discuss nuclear security. Uh, but uh, And the summit is already underway, but uh, who's not here is uh, Ukraine's new prime minister, Arseniy Tsenyuk. He decided not to come to the Netherlands, saying that they need to continue negotiations with the IMF on financial aid. But this has raised some eyebrows uh, with many analysts saying it may have been a good idea for Kiev to come here to The Hague and explain all these statements that have been coming out of Ukraine this whole month from different officials saying basically that Kiev may restore its nuclear arsenal in the nearest future. Here are just a few examples of what's been said. We want peace, but we now we realize that if you either someone protects you, like NATO, the United States or some other big state, if they cannot, there is no choice then you have to protect yourself, only having nuclear weapons. That's why now many people in Ukraine discuss, have we made a mistake giving up nuclear weapons for guarantees of security? Once we restock our nuclear arsenal, it will be a very different conversation. Ukraine has all the required nuclear technology, 
and it will take us three to six months. Frankly, it's quite surprising that uh, politicians in the West, in Western Europe uh, specifically, still haven't commented on these statements coming from Kiev, uh, from a country uh, where there's been two revolutions only in the, in the last 10 years, and having it go nuclear should at least uh, raise some concern uh, in Europe and especially in the West. But given this overwhelming support in the West of the new authorities in Kiev, the question is how will this policy go well and work together with the ideas of nuclear non-proliferation without these two contradicting one another. Now, rebuilding Ukraine's nuclear arsenal aside, there's also a risk of low-grade radioactive material falling into the wrong hands. Now, let's take a look at this map. Ukraine, you can see, is heavily dependent on nuclear power. More than half its electricity comes from this source. As you can see, a variety of nuclear-related facilities are dotted all over the country. Now, the surge in crime and instability that followed the unrest has prompted Kiev to deploy extra security forces to protect vulnerable stockpiles. And according to Graham Phillips, a British journalist and blogger living in Ukraine, the Kiev government could be looking for a pretext to militarize its nuclear program. They're making increasing noises about re-establishing their nuclear armament, which was at one time, of course, before the 1994 Budapest Memorandum, the third largest in the world in terms of a nuclear stockpile. So we're talking about a mass nuclear power. And so you have to look at things now through the basis of what's been put forward um, is being done in many ways in this talk of, of this massing of Russian troops. Ukraine is looking for leverage to start doing that, to start re-establishing uh, some form of nuclear armaments. A junta was being formed in Kiev. The government, uh, Democratic, had been overthrown. And it was very clear at that stage that Svoboda, which is a neo-Nazi party, was coming to power, was seizing power. Well, Kiev has ordered the withdrawal of all remaining Ukrainian troops from Crimea days after the peninsula officially rejoined Russia. Crimean authorities claim that there were no Ukrainian military bases left in the region that hadn't raised the Russian flags. Artis Paul Aslia has more from the regional capital, Simferopol. The Ukrainian Defense Ministry has ordered all Ukrainian military personnel who are currently serving inside Crimea to be evacuated. At the same time, all the families of the servicemen are also being taken out of Crimea. The official reason being given is to try and prevent any kind of provocation or any kind of violence towards the Ukrainian military. But the point needs to be made that from the beginning of this independent movement, all military bases here in Crimea pledged allegiance to the Crimean authorities and those authorities in turn did make an offer that if any of these servicemen did not want to serve inside Crimea they were free to leave and very few took up that offer. This follows a referendum in which the overwhelming majority of Crimeans voted in support of joining Russia. What this means is that ties between Crimea and Kiev will be severed but for the time being there are still electrical power lines that supply electricity to to Crimea coming from Ukraine and overnight around 30 percent of those lines were cut. Now it's not yet clear what caused the power shortages. The situation has been stabilized. We are hearing from the energy company that there were faults in the lines and that their servicemen addressed them throughout the night and the hours of this morning. But at the same time the first deputy prime minister of Crimea says that he believes this is a blatant provocation from Kiev, he says that they are ready for it. They do have mobile diesel generators on standby so that ultimately they will not need to rely on Kiev for their energy supplies. Around a week ago, there were threats by the right sector that they were going to cut gas supplies. Either way, the situation is alarming. But as I say, for now, it has been returned to normality. Well, Moscow is now focused on keeping Crimea's economy gaps filled. According to regional authorities, it will take a couple of months to become self-sufficient when it comes to electricity. But the infrastructure revival includes a lot more than that. It will take billions of dollars to provide the region with power. Then there are social payments to meet and a bridge linking the peninsula to the mainland, which are all going to cost a pretty penny. But I can tell you there are also some benefits. Russia will save around $300 million on its uh, naval base rent, which it no longer has to pay, of course. The gas discount is now gone for Ukraine, which could bring Moscow over $10 billion in the coming years. And the South Stream pipeline will cost less as the country is planning to partially use the mainland for construction. 
That's just an estimate, of course. These are all just estimates, but figures already show that uh, there is plenty of room for optimism. Now, as experts start to make predictions on Ukraine's post-election future, many agree the interim prime minister has a slim chance of staying in power. The dire economic situation and the mishandling of relations with Russia have apparently dealt a blow to Arsenia Yatsenyuk's authority. Plus, the mixed signals that many read into his statements aren't helping, as RT's Marina Kosareva explains. Arseniy Yatsenyuk loves to talk, but he might be shooting himself in the foot in the process because, as I'm about to show you, he has a love and hate relationship with pretty much everyone. They did a good job making the global economy dependent on the US dollar and printing these banknotes using them to buy whatever. I wonder if he shared those thoughts while he was schmoozing with Barack Obama at the White House. Well, what's interesting is that Yatsenu goes on to say, and that is that America has made the likes of Russia a victim of its financial manipulations. All the money they'd made by selling their oil and gas, they never got the chance to actually use, wasting it instead to maintain the exchange rate of their currency. And now that money's gone. But what Russia does have, according to Yatsenyuk, is a very capable leader. Those changes that took place when Mr. Putin came to office, he accomplished his historic mission, which was to save Russia with its wide gaps between classes, clans, with its oligarchs. Well, it's too bad he doesn't want to work with a man he speaks so highly of. Well, Kiev did want to work with NATO at one point. Would you be surprised if I told you that Yatsenyuk has a bone to pick with them as well? <laughs> Do you know why NATO wouldn't buy our military cargo aircraft? I really wonder why, because we're supposed to be partners. Well, he changed his mind when it comes to joining the alliance, but what about his beloved union? You know, the reason why all this chaos was created in the first place. We will become part of Europe because we are Europeans. I'm making this my top priority. I want Ukraine to be part of Europe. Oh, the glory of joining the EU. He's been singing their praises for years now, pounding his chest, screaming that it's the only way forward, only to admit that it could never happen. Nobody is going to join anybody. We got it. Moreover, it is a country with a population of 46 million people and whose total area is equal to the territory of France. It is a territory that is kind of a border zone, sort of a large border belt between the EU and Russia, between democracy and an axis of evil. The EU wants to make it a security buffer. Oh, there's another little dig at Russia. But it's not about digs and who he does or doesn't support. It's about having a plan. And it's the lack of one that's got many people worried, and including those who supported him and his coup. Why? Because they no longer know what they are supporting. Marina Kostreva, RT. Now, the interim government in Kiev is hesitating over whether to introduce a visa regime with Russia. The country's prime minister called for more time to decide the issue, soon after the proposal was raised by the national security minister. Now, here's one of the reasons that uh, that could be. According to the Russian Migration Service, nearly three million Ukrainians came to Russia seeking employment. Last year alone, they earned around $30 billion. That's almost the sum Kiev needs to save its economy. What's more, it's twice as much as Ukraine hopes to get from its Western partners. And to many of its citizens, Russia's the only job market there is. Concerned about their safety, uh, back home, some people we spoke to asked to remain anonymous. I've been in Russia for more than eight years already. I'm working as a welder. In Ukraine, it's hard to find a job, especially a well-paid one. Many of my acquaintances are working here. If they decide to introduce a visa regime between Ukraine and Russia, it's going to hit ordinary people hard. It has been already a month that I've been working in Russia. I am forced to work here as I need to earn money. In Ukraine, jobs are poorly paid. Many of my acquaintances are coming to Russia to make a living. I don't know if it's safe to come back to Ukraine now. Ukrainians were coming to Russia 15 years ago, five years ago. I'm working here for the sixth year. Over this period, we've formed our own community and we're helping each other with finding jobs and a place to live. 
people who really want to work in Russia will find a way to come here, and they will be grateful to this country for the opportunity to work and earn decent wages. 